Ms. Priyanka Idukula is a certified professional midwife who heads Birth Village, a natural birthing center, and is a managing trustee of Birth for Change. She has presented her masterclass on birthing positions, and I invite her now to take questions in relation to her masterclass. Yeah, hello everyone. And obviously to everybody who is um, logging in right now, uh, good morning, good evening, and good afternoon to all of you. So I had a lot of fun uh, doing up my masterclass, uh, which was on alternate uh, birthing positions. Uh, something that I really enjoy uh, every single day of my career, um, because it's always been uh, a driving passion for me ever since I started midwifery um, about women birthing upright. And I was so glad that NLBC actually gave me the opportunity. And I should really thank the organizers for choosing this topic for me, uh, because it is one of my passions. Each and every day when I see women giving birth upright, um, I cannot tell you the, the power and the joy that um, I as a midwife experience. And when I see a woman birthing on how she would like to be, right? Um, giving birth to a child. So there's a couple of questions that is on my screen right now. So I'm just going to go through each one of them. Uh, the first question that's on the screen is, um, how can we train medical students and obstetricians on birthing in alternative position? So I think the first answer to this would be, obviously is um, exposure to how a natural birth should look like. And that's best learned, I, in my opinion, with a midwife. I think the birth environment matters a lot. Um, I think uh, witnessing a woman uh, move before we reach birthing positions, it's really about mobility in labor, seeing that it's normal, seeing that it's okay. Um, and, that is, and after seeing that is when we go to birthing positions. So definitely first is just um, viewing birth as a natural process is important. Where do they get to learn it? I feel, in my opinion, again, it is through midwives. Third, I feel there needs to be a, a lot more of exchange of ideas. As a student, you should be open to really uh, more conversations on what women want from birth. We can't come to a classroom with a textbook saying, you've got to birth like A, B, and C. And today, so many changes today because social media has opened up like crazy. And you can get to read so many accounts of women saying, when you run a poll, uh, most of the poll responses are, I really did not like uh, being strapped down. I really did not like my obstetrician telling me to lie down. I wanted to get up. This is an often repeated uh, question on so many forums. So as a student, I think that should be a starting point is listening to what women have to say. And when we start listening to them, we begin to want to change our practice. Uh, I also feel it's totally okay to question. It's totally okay to have an aha moment. Um, and sometimes, yes, it's hard when you're a student and you think differently and your superiors think differently. But, you know, there's always, always scope to do certain things that you feel is right in the interest of the woman because nobody matters more than the mother in that birth space, right? So I think that's where it starts from. Um, and sadly enough, uh, this question is very relevant because when you ask a room full of uh, uh, students or you ask a room full of young doctors, or even it doesn't have to be young doctors, doctors across the board, um, even I have, we have even asked for example, have you ever seen a birth uh, upright? And they say, no, I haven't seen one. Uh, so that's the reality of the situation. But there's a lot uh, that can be done to change this. And the first one obviously lies in exposure to how birth should be like. Um, the next question that was asked is, if a woman does not attend antenatal childbirth preparation classes and has no knowledge of labor and birth, will she also instinctively adopt the position she finds comfortable? My answer to this is yes. She, um, the, one of the first labors I attended as a childbirth educator is when the mother 
was begging that I want to get up. And she knew, honestly, we really didn't practice positions. I didn't teach her the positions, I should say to be right, because I felt her birth is going to be in the lithotomy position. Why should I bother? That is how I thought of way back in 2008. And uh, I it was so, um, it was such a light bulb moment for me to see this woman ask, I won't get up, I want to get up, can I please try some other position? But unfortunately, that's not what happened. She had to birth her twins uh, in the lithotomy position. And so it's clear to me that we pretty much mimic um, all mammals around us because mammals obviously go on their fours. Uh, you know, there's a really nice poster that I teach in the class. Would you ever see an elephant uh, birth lying on its back? No. Uh, then why would we expect a woman to do the same? So I think instinctively, we are all meant to stand up. We are all meant to crouch, lean forward. We are all instinctively drop down to a squat position. As long as nobody robs that away, that's how women have always given birth. Um, I can add one more example to this is, I remember one woman who had, um, she came in from Africa and it was her third birth here, her two births were attended by midwives in Africa um, at home. So the third one, and she wanted to go into squat position because that's how she had her first two babies. But here, obviously, everybody was crowding onto her and said, you need to lie down, you need to lie on the bed. And she said, immediately, she just pushed everybody and said, you people go there. I'm going to stand and I will show you how I'm going to do this. And they kind of stepped back for a minute. And she said, look, I'm a mother of two. I'm going to give birth to my third one right now. And honestly, in that room, at that point of time, nobody really had anyone, beyond, nobody had more than one child. And they just watched her giving birth in the squat position. And somewhere they felt, okay, maybe she really knows what she's talking about. And she's a mother. And that's right, because a mother knows what's best and what drives to have that baby naturally. Um, the other question, and there's also another second part of my answer is, I also feel women will do what is expected out of them. So in a way, if we as midwives and obstetricians don't really uh, encourage them uh, in positive positions of their choice or show them, hey, you know what? You could birth like this also. You could birth hands and knees. You could do this, you could do that. Sometimes a little bit of that um, education, let me put it that way, uh, or a little bit of uh, showing them pictures and slides of other women who have done it, which I think works very well in my class. I think that's very important and that will definitely uh, change uh, that whole picture of how a baby is being born. So that's something that I believe in. Um, so I think that a little bit of prodding is good and a little bit of conversation around it because unfortunately today women, their mothers would have all given birth in the lithotomy position and um, that's just what they've heard of, right? And also the media images unfortunately adds uh, fuel uh, to the fire because every single image you see in the movies is a woman lying flat on her back and she's screaming, she's rolling her head from side to side. This is what we all watch in the Indian movies, right? So to kind of turn that around, I think we have a responsibility to show that birth can definitely be in better position. So I think that is uh, important in terms of uh, exposure uh, for our women as to how birth can actually be. Um, the third question is, what has been the most difficult, inconvenient position you've encountered as a midwife in your career? And can you share with us how you handled it? So I, I can't say, it wasn't, it was definitely not inconvenient for me, but maybe a bit challenging is I can recount maybe two instances. Uh, instance one is um, we once had, a, <laughs> we once had a mom who wanted, she was just standing and she was breathing at a t-shirt that her husband was wearing. And that t-shirt had a polo on it. And she would look at that polo and breathe. She would breathe with each contraction, like she, so, so basically her focal point is the polo on his t-shirt. And she wouldn't let her husband to move left or right. So she wants to breathe standing looking at that polo and poor man, I don't even remember him having even a, a, a bathroom break even 
so um, it was really um, what do i say it was interesting it was funny it was ch- challenging for me first because we had to actually get in in the middle uh, because when she was birthing she was going about standing and there's no way she was going to move or budge so one midwife went in between her legs and one midwife went in between the husband's legs and it was kind of funny because we were you know kind of between both of them between two pairs of legs trying to hold a baby so that's a bit funny uh, but that was something that happened one i would say it's more funny actually more than difficult another one time when we had a birth was uh, when there was a mom who was um, trying to uh, birth her baby and she was holding her husband in the front which is fine and i was behind i was trying to catch the baby but what i found interesting is her son was also there right in front of me and he was trying to drive this toy car up his mother's foot all the way up he said mother the car is going to meet the baby his car is going to meet his brother all the way up and i'm like okay so he's driving a car from one leg and i'm trying to kind of navigate myself so i can just say that these are funny instances i can't call them really difficult because it wasn't difficult uh, i think it's more funny actually so that's my answer to that question um yeah so have you ever encountered a, a third or a fourth degree care in your in your career and if so how would you tackle it yes yes of course so i've definitely um had a uh, third degree uh, tears it has happened probably um thrice in my career which has been over 10 years now um and um i can say that um when we have had third degree tears interestingly they were not in the upright birth positions we had to choose macrobots positions because we felt we were going to have a shoulder dystocia we anticipated one and we needed to do that and that is exactly when we had a third degree tear so it wasn't the active birth positions where i encountered it um i encountered it more when uh, we had those two two cases definitely it was um in the um the thought in not in the thought position but in the necropsis position is when we encountered it and when we had a third degree tear obviously we have to refer um to the surgeon to get this repaired and the repair was performed and the mother is perfectly fine so that's how that was dealt with uh what is your common tear for doctors in your practice first or second degree so i would say mostly we have first degree tears that's the first i would say now minor first degree tears obviously we do not suture uh second degree tears we do suture uh and that's how we would deal with that um how often you need to suture these tears yeah like i said first degree tears uh we uh we don't second degree tears we do um and i think um we i've all through the years my practice what i've seen is uh if we can suture as less as possible um because sometimes putting in more stitches actually damages the tissue more so i think it's really about realistically about um what works best uh for the mom and reassessing from and i think it takes a couple of years of practice i also feel um there are certain things which i feel is good like using aloe vera gel for example uh using uh, cold pads so those certain cultures don't approve of using anything cold on the perineum i feel cold pads mothers feel a lot of relief with it uh, we use um, calendula tincture we use uh, aloe vera gel um we, these things i feel really help in speeding up um uh, the healing process um and we are really particular about our six baths which is about using calendula which is about using uh, garlic which is about using uh, a couple of other herbs all put together we make a poultice sometimes out of this um and i think that really works for us in terms of healing and we've never really now i should say this uh, we've never really had to use uh, betadine um at all i've never used it in my practice uh, because i feel it's quite harsh uh and we have excellent healing results excellent is the word for it by using these herbal remedies in the post cart period um the next question i have is what is the longest time uh you waited with a woman with full dilation of her cervix <laughs> okay so probably that's a bit of a controversial question but anyway i shall answer it so we had a mom who came in and she was 5 cm and she reached um can probably within 4 or 5 hours 
Now she remained fully dilated for the next 24 hours. Yeah, she didn't feel any urge to push or anything at all for the next 24. We crossed a good 24 hours with her. Um, and she didn't have much, I mean, she would have contractions, but not really strong ones. It just phased out. She was just doing other things. And um, she was just doing her thing. That's what I would like to call it. Um, and then, interestingly, by midnight, her contractions just picked up and she just pushed out the baby. So that was it. I know it sounds, I mean, you know, when you really break it up and you're going to put a photograph onto it, obviously it doesn't fit. But the truth is that was a particular case that I had. So that's the longest I have seen. What did I do while she waited? Actually, she just ate. She walked uh, a lot of mobility, definitely. And she walked uh, a, a lot of steps. We did a lot of lunges. Um, we worked uh, with her um, more to do with um, asynclitic positions that were good. Obviously, lunges were really good for her. Uh, even the side lunges were really good. Um, I, we, I think we gave her that. And also, apart from, more than anything else, we just gave her some space. Because she was good. Uh, baby was good. There was nothing else happening, per se. She was just... Um, and her contractions were quite spaced out. So we just gave her some time. And, of course, long amount of time. And then she had a baby. Uh, what is your take on the Walsh's position? So the Walsh's position, I think it's comfortable. This is my opinion. It's comfortable for a woman who has been exposed to spinning babies to a certain extent, who is flexible. See now, for example, I'm just fresh from two labors right now. And I had one mom who's pretty active and pretty mobile uh, and one was not. So I think the one who was really mobile, we were able to do a lot of different positions with her. And I think, you no, know, we didn't have to use the vultures, but I think somebody who's really um, been exposed to movement, activity, and kind of drilled in, you know, that this is going to help get a tough baby out. That's where I think vultures is likely to work better. Um, birth tools, I love them. I don't even know how I would practice without a birth tool. I just love them. I think it's great. Sometimes I feel women just like to sit on it. It gives them some a bit of a rest. Then they can stand up and they can squat down again. I think it's great. I think it's a tool that every midwife can have or every obstetrician should have. It doesn't cost me money to make a small, simple stool. You don't need anything fancy at all. So I think it's great. What about teaching about possible positions in antenatal care? 100%. Every woman, I think we should spend at least two hours showing them every possible position as to how this baby can come out because that's when they start thinking and we get them to, I mean, the classes I always teach them, would you poop lying down on your back? No, right? We will all sit up. So that's when they're like, yeah. And I'm like, pushing is just like that. You're going to give a lot of pressure and you're going to feel a lot of, lot of pressure. It's almost similar to pooping. So you really need to kind of, have those bells ringing a little bit. So I'm all for teaching them all possible positions. Now, for some educators ask this question, what if my hospital doesn't practice this position? Should I show them everything? Yes, you should, because it's about being truthful, authentic, and honest. So 100%, you, need, you are committed to show them every single position. It doesn't matter whether they'll be used or not. But as your duty as an educator, as an honest midwife, and as an honest obstetrician, whoever is handling the classes, should teach all positions to women because they deserve to know. Um, another question that came in is, I think there's definitely a shift here in Ireland to teach women birth positions in antenatal classes. Great. I always teach them in my yoga and birthing classes. Awesome. One of the most empowering tools for women and their birth partners. I completely agree. And that's how it should be. Is there a choice for all women? Example for multi-gravid women, it is suggested not to walk around. Sometimes they may delve in their bathrooms. What's your advice? Absolutely not. There should be no difference. And I want to talk a little bit about birthing on the toilet seat. And that's there in the masterclass. Women, now today I had a young girl early morning. You know, she was 25, very simple, from the village. No exposure to WhatsApp and all the stuff, social stuff. She just came in and she just, she really could not comprehend a lot of things, but, and she's very simple, but she just wanted to go to the toilet seat because that's where she felt happy. And I said, no problem, we'll sit there and she's having a second baby. And I said, we'll sit there and she sat there. 
three pushes. We saw a bit of crowning and she, we just kind of gently guided her to the uh, bathroom. Now it comes the baby. That's it. We do, we, you know, one of my midwives used to tell me in the group, I'm so scared when, you, when I see you taking them to the toilet seat because I feel the baby will come out. That's a misconception. That's a total misconception because remember that we relax our pelvic floors the best when we're on the toilet seat. There's no doubt about that. There's that sense of freedom. We feel more private. That's just where you will feel better. So there's no, there should be no fear at all. And babies are not going to just jump out like that. That's not happening. It takes a little bit of time. So please take them to where they feel safe and comfortable. So that's my choice. That's my answer. Um, yes, so definitely walking and going to the bathroom for a woman who's having a second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth baby is totally fine. There's no problem. And I think it's more of fear from the care provider side the woman actually doesn't think anything, right? So that's it. Um, your opinion about continuous monitoring, if everything is okay, we want the pregnant women mobilized, but we can't see that everywhere. See, I feel continuous monitoring is not, let's look at what the evidence has to say, right? The WHO has clearly mentioned that intermittent monitoring via a Doppler is what is recommended and not continuous monitoring. And that is the truth and that's factual and that's evidence-based. Now, why is continuous monitoring so much in place? It's very simple because we have machines and they don't get tired and you get the output and you get the graph. So I feel um, we, we need to really understand why are we doing continuous monitoring in the first place? I feel um, there's no requirement, especially if it's a normal physiological labor, it's progressing by itself. There's no drugs being involved. I don't see a reason why continuous monitoring has a place over there. So I think that's the first thing I would look at. Uh, mm -hmm. So if it's a not healthy woman and she's doing great, she's doing fine, there's absolutely no reason for it. That's my opinion. Um, and we want that pregnant women mobilized and we can't see that. Yes, obviously, because if pregnant women are connected to way too many things, they cannot mobilize, right? There's too many, I always say there's too many wires going on there. And that's exactly why these women can't get up. So as someone who's serving women um, in all its authenticity, I think we need to stand with women. And if it's not necessary, uh, obviously we should not be supporting that. We should be supporting what's truthful, what's factual. And again, if a woman is high risk, or uh, let's say if she is being induced and her uh, pregnancy uh, mandates Continuous monitoring, that's a different story. But if not, then it's definitely a question mark as to why she's on continuous monitoring. Um, do you consider specific birth positions for a mother based on musculoskeletal or neurological deficits often? So I should say that um, we've not had really women in our practice who have had this issue. Uh, but yes, I do see that specific birth positions might be better for a woman who's having this uh, because it has to be based on her comfort. It may not be that everything that we suggest in class might be appropriate for her. So I agree on that point. Um, special considerations for a large gestational age baby for normal birth. Look, um, see, I feel, um, I feel that the a large gestational age baby. Now, you know, some people have asked me, if I have a small baby, will, will it not be easy to pop out? I don't think that's true at all. Uh, because I've had some large babies just come really easy out and some small babies really give me a tough time. So I can't say that. But I think the rules are the same. It's pretty much movement. In its See, again, in my practice, I've really not had to use a lot of this. Uh, I'm being very truthful about that is I've not really had to use a lot of it. Um, I've not felt a big difference either. Uh, so I can't really um, say anything from a personal point of view, but I'm sure there are people who have experienced it. Uh, but from personal point of view, I cannot answer the question because like I said, we've not had women use the trochanter code and the has not had much. Um, yeah, so... Um, I think what's important is that um, giving women the freedom to choose, 
um, giving women the right to feel safe and no position is wrong. And you'd be surprised at, um, uh, I mean, I think I've not, we've not really put it out there, but I think we have recently discovered a new position in labor wherein a woman uh, gave birth um, kind of leaning against her husband. She wasn't standing, she wasn't squatting, she's somewhere in between. And I didn't see any of those, but I'm hoping to make a picture out of it and put it out there to say, you know what, hey, what, hey, see, hey, what, look at this, there's a new position out here. No position is wrong. No position is shameful. Uh, they, you know, we've, we've been taught in certain textbooks when a woman is giving birth, she wants to be parents are strong, it's dirty, people slap their hands. There's nothing that's shameful, bad, or wrong in this. A woman can give birth the way she wants, how she likes it to be, uh, with full freedom uh, on what she feels is right. Uh, I think that's very, very important for us to realize and uh, not to, uh, you know, make her feel small or make her feel bad because some women honestly are a bit timid and they really want to get up, but they're fearful of what we as care providers will say or what will our body language mean to them. Uh, and it shouldn't be like that. It should never be like that. In fact, we need to be even more sensitive to the women in our country who don't speak great English, who, who, who may not have enough resources, who really don't understand all our verbal jingle. We need to come down to their level and say, you can also do this. You know, we need to come down. And I sometimes I feel sad when I see people saying, you know, these are all only meant for people who are of a particular education background or a particular caliber. It's not about that. Uh, birth positions, I feel, um, are a woman's right. And that's my, um, I think my signing off note, right? Uh, so thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Uh, I really, really would like to thank the Fernandez Foundation uh, for bringing this to India. And um, like I said, it's very coincidental for me, it's birth position because it's one of my favorite topics. Um, but thank you again so much uh, for putting this together. Um, and I must say the scientific team did a great job. Thank you so much. If there's any questions that anybody would like to ask anymore, you're most free to ping us on our Instagram page, Birth College India, or write into us or put it across to the uh, Fernandez team and hopefully I should be able to answer it some more. Thank you so much again. Bye.